Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, interesting weather day, right? I wasn't sure if we were all going to end up with power or not, uh, or any kind of um, internet media services to help us do this. Um, my name is Alicia Adler. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for Kitsap County DCD, Department of Community Development. And we're so glad you could join us today for this webinar. We have a couple of content specialists and I'd like to introduce them to you right now. We have Angie Silva, who is our assistant director at DCD. And we have Liz Williams, who's our planning and environmental programs manager. We also have Angela Hanners, who is um, from marketing and communications. So thanks so much, everyone. Uh, we'll get started sharing our screen. Before I start, I just want to, um, if you have any questions along the way, it's best to use your Q&A button at the bottom that we could see that and answer that. And any answers that happen there are then visible to everyone, all of our attendees. Otherwise, um, if you put messages in chat, it may not be seen by anyone else and it may be overlooked in our questions. So there will be an opportunity at the end of the presentation to ask those questions. And I just recommend the Q&A is the best method to do that. So um, the Start Here program, for those of you who have been here before, this is, oh gosh, our fifth or sixth presentation for the Start Here program. It is a land use and building development basics program that we have done here at Kitsap County. It's basic level education, re education resources to facilitate um, and support you with your land use and building development projects. It is done by a, conducted by a grant through EPA and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's called the Improving Landowner Development Decisions Grant. Um, it is a social marketing education and outreach program. And as I mentioned, we would like to proactively improve landowner development decisions um, to mitigate any negative impacts to land cover, stormwater, and critical, other critical areas. This program was created under targeted research. We used three years of permit services customers, single family resident applicants, focus groups, uh, staff at DCD, some data mining, surveys and focus groups to come up with some, kind, some method to deliver this program. And again, with the target to reach you before you apply for permits. So if you go to our Start Here webpage, you will see the previous webinars we've had there before. You will see new brochures for the topics that we have been covering, as well as links to some of our participants who are professionals in the industry who have been through this program and um, are sharing information. We are hoping through this, we could increase awareness, improve site design, reduce costly missteps for people and reduce the impact to natural resources. Today, we'll be talking about the Growth Management Act. We'll hope to cover what is the Growth Management Act? Why do we have it? How does it protect critical areas? And um, I'm sure you wanna know how it potentially affects your project. So to begin, I'm gonna hand this off to Angie Silva. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you everybody again for joining us today. Today has been a quite an interesting weather <laughs> development here in our beautiful uh, Kitsap County. Um, but today we're here to talk about the Washington State Growth Management Act, or GMA for short uh, slang for uh, those that live and breathe this every, every day. So if we take a, 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 a step back in the Wayback Machine, managing growth has been a multi-decade conversation here in the state of Washington and really picked 
picked up quite a bit in the 1980s when we saw a lot of growth happening, um, not only statewide, but a lot in the Puget Sound Basin and a lot of low density sprawl like development occurring in many counties and cities across the state that were gobbling up farmland, as well as not necessarily keeping up pace for all the capital uh, facility needs, including transportation and degrading some of our more sensitive uh, habitat and wildlife areas in our communities that we love so dear and near to our heart. So in the 1990s, the Washington State Legislature created a framework at the state level the Growth Management Act, or GMA, that set forth uh, guiding principles on a number of topics, including overarching planning goals we'll talk later today, as well as elements that are required for not only Kitsap County, but the cities within, but we'll get into that later. And as a result of being here and established for going on 30 years in Washington State, there is a lot of administrative rules that local jurisdictions such as Kitsap County has to follow, as well as case law interpretation, whether that occurred through the Washington State Growth Management Hearings Board or higher in the judicial system, such as Superior Court, Court of Appeals, but also all the way up to the Washington State Supreme Court. And just to take a back at statewide, Kitsap County and the cities within are not the only jurisdiction in the state of Washington that has to plan to GMA. So if you look at that mint, mint color on your screen there, and you see the weird uh, di diagram of the Kitsap Peninsula and you spread out, all the mint green jurisdictions and counties and the cities within must fully plan to the GMA requirements. So that's 18 of us. And if you look at that light blue uh, color, Predominantly on the eastern side of, of the state, you see certain jurisdictions that can opt in to fully plan as a voluntary thing. But statewide, again, monitoring as part of GMA is protection of critical areas and natural resource land. So just a little nuance, depending on what, you, what jurisdiction you live or reside or plan to build your dream home, for example. So one of the things we get a questions a lot at the Department of Community Development, whether that's through our Kitsap One services, online, our public meetings, or even through the Planning Commission is why do jurisdictions plan? And even whether it's our own personal finances or retirement, long-term planning helps contribute to the success of in our lives. And these elements help make great communities. In addition to part of that Washington State Growth Management Act is also planning for capital investments over not only a six year period, but also a 20 year period. And by setting forth those sideboards on needed infrastructure, as well as the growth we need to accommodate within our jurisdiction, this also sets up a financing structure to seek additional grants and loans to help build public investments that also lead into private investments in our communities. And so one of the principles of the Growth Management Act are 14 goals, and they cross a whole slew of disciplines that, that not only trickle into regional uh, planning guidance, but also our local development regulations, as well as our local comprehensive plans. So I'll take a couple just goals here, shorelines and uh, natural resources, some of those things in environment we just went through a process of updating our not only our Shoreline Management Act, but also our Critical Areas Ordinance, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later in today's presentation, for compliance of not only the GMA requirements, but also other statutory commitments. So of these goals noted in the Growth Man Management Act, which includes a description, these goals are not prioritized. So as part of our task in local communities, as well as subdivisions of the state, is how to balance all these goals to for desired communities and how we handle growth in the future. So like many rules and regulations, it's like an onion. You have to peel one layer off that further guides another layer of that. So as we, we talked about earlier, that Growth Management Act, that overarching state mandate, sets a lot of different principles. I mentioned the Critical Areas Ordinance, which I'll talk about, but also how to guide the majority of growth in communities, which is designated in urban growth areas or city jurisdictions. That overarching state mandate then. Uh, 
goes into re- multi-county regional policy. So here in the Puget Sound Basin, Kitsap County, and the cities within are members of the Puget Sound Regional Coordinating Council, or PSRC for short. And they develop multi-county planning policies that help guide not only local, regional, countywide planning policies, such as the CPPs on your screen right there, where Kitsap and the cities need to follow, but also how all those little layers of the onion influence and help shape local comprehensive plans, as well as local development regulations. And one of those uh, requirements, part of GMA, but also go into one of the layer of that onion picture we just saw in our comprehensive plan, we're required by state law to have mandatory elements. Development of goals and policies in our comprehensive plan, whether that's about rural development, whether that happens to be about land use and urban growth areas and the densities within transportation, capital facilities, but also parks and open space as well. And I mentioned this before, and I don't want I don't want anybody to deter take this slide and not see the really great webinar we did in August about critical areas ordinance. But where that the requirement for CAOs or critical areas ordinance comes from the Washington State Growth Management Act, GMA requires all counties to adopt regulations to protect critical areas, whether that's fish and wildlife habitat, wetlands, and the various functions and values of those all the way to our critical aquifer recharge areas, which where in Kitsap, we get a lot of our drinking water from, but also geological hazardous areas. And again, this uh, webinar on the CAO, I think it was in August, and again, it is available on the Start Here website. Miss Liz. All right, thanks, Angie. Um, so you may be wondering, you know, how the Growth Management Act um, impacts you and your project. Um, so one of the things that we recommend um, here at the county, we have this great tool uh, we refer to as Parcel Search, uh, which we can go through and walk through during the question and answer session, kind of how you navigate that and locate it on the county's website. Uh, but that tool will tell you whether or not you're located, uh, your property is located within an urban growth area or as part of the rural uh lands and that really will impact um, you know what level of development you can have on your property um, in addition to it'll tell you what your comprehensive plan designation is which is that 20-year vision out into the future um, in addition to your zoning uh, which regulates you know how high you can build buildings setbacks from the property lines and what types of uses can be built on what properties across the county um, in addition to it will identify some of the critical area features that are known and mapped across the county, um, such as critical drainage areas, uh, which definitely impact um, the, the types of development that you can have on your specific property. And then uh, we encourage participation. One of the foundational components of the Growth Management Act is early and continuous public participation in the development of both the comprehensive plan in addition to development regulations. Um, so on the horizon currently, uh, Kitsap County will be updating our comprehensive plan, uh, which the next one is due on or before June 30th of 2024. And that will establish the 20 year uh, roadmap for Kitsap County and all the goals and policies related to those mandatory elements that Angie mentioned earlier. Um, and during that process, there will be opportunities for the public to engage and participate and help shape uh, the development of that plan, as long as you know it's consistent with the Growth Management Act and the planning policies that have been established um, at both the local and regional level. Um, in addition to the county is you know regularly updating and amending our development regulations. So things like the critical areas ordinance has a regular schedule that it goes through update processes. Um, and during those reviews, there are opportunities for the public to engage. Um, and we definitely encourage that early engagement be before a project is 
proposed next to you and it becomes a surprise, um, these are opportunities to kind of have early insight and, and feedback into shaping what happens across the landscape. Um, we also encourage participation um, and advocacy at the state level um, because the Growth Management Act is established by you know, rulemaking um, at that level. So engaging with your state legislature, um, if there are elements of the Growth Management Act that you don't agree with, um, that's a really great way to share your feedback um, and again, uh, participate in, in how this impacts your projects here locally in Kitsap County. And then we're going to share in the chat. Um, there's a ton of great resources and links available if you want to take a deeper dive into this topic. Um, the Washington State Department of Commerce um, is the go-to source that we utilize on a regular basis, uh, which provides guidance to local jurisdictions. Um, I mentioned parcel search. Uh, we'll take an opportunity to kind of navigate through that and how, how you can find your property and see the different um, features and how um, it might impact what you'd like to do in the future. Um, and then we have tons of maps um, available as well on our website. Um, in addition to taking a look at our existing comprehensive plan, um, which is currently planning out to 2036 and how we are going to accommodate um, population within our urban areas and help protect our rural, rural lands as well. Um, and then we do have some brochures available on our critical areas ordinance. Um, in addition to all of our past webinars are available online if you want to take a look and review those. So with that, I think we're up to questions. So fire away. Just as a reminder, if you can use your uh, Q&A section to ask questions. That way, when your questions come up and get answered, they can be viewed by everyone um, who may not have caught the information. Thank you. Come on, everybody, don't be shy, or you'll have to sit me uh, sit here and hear me jabber on about UGA boundaries and where to find all this good information. No takers? Uh-oh. You're forced to play my hand here. We're going to look at uh, parcel search. Oh, I think we got a chat in the window here. Let's yeah. see here. Uh, one question. Are large developments required to include affordable housing units? This is a really great question and part of a lot of policy discussions, not, all, not only at the state level, regional level, but right here in Kitsap County. And Liz has been working on a development agreement to looking at a project in Silverdome, in particular about requiring it. But Liz, why don't you take this one as I know you're so uh, close to that particular project. Sure. Um, so currently the county does not have um, requirements for every project to um, include affordable housing units, but as part of a recent amendment to the county's comprehensive plan for a site in Silverdale, as Angie mentioned, um, the board did require that 10% of all future uh, housing units on that site be dedicated to affordable housing. Um, and that would be to any families or individuals that are making um, uh, 80% or less of our county median income and um, being able to ensure that that is um, provided to either a first time home buyer at an affordable price based on their income or uh, providing rental units for a minimum of 10 years um, associated with uh, that development project. So depending on the future build out of that site, um, that is one way that the county is currently looking at establishing um, potentially a model that could be replicated in other areas um, on other sites in the future. Um, so excited about that opportunity to really establish um, some affordable housing for the Silverdale area. Thank you, Ms. Liz. So I'm gonna take a couple questions. We had a couple questions related to kind of parcel search. So if you go to kitsapgov.com, that was also included in the chat window as a direct link. You can find a lot of different information, including a question we got about critical areas map use of colors in the legend it's in. 
So I just zoomed in, and I think my bandwidth is a little slow uh, today, but I zoomed in the central Kitsap area uh, of the uh, community. And if you look on the left-hand side, there's a legend and layer list. You see this drop-down menu here, if you choose a theme, one of the features you can look at and go, am I in a rural area or am I in an urban area? And what's my zoning? And the densities and all the rules I have to follow within that. So if you see on my screen here, kind of a interesting looking uh, camel, that's the Silverdale Urban Growth Area or Silverdale UGA itself. And all the different colors in here represents different zoning requirements, including density and uh, dimensions and setback requirements, parking standards, if you will. So looking in, it could tell you a little bit, do I need to be at a minimum of five units per acre or is this one home per five acres in the green area? That helps you distinguish and zero in on a parcel level. And there was a question related to critical areas. So again, same thing, look on the left-hand side, choose a theme, drop down menu. Critical areas is one of those features. And you're gonna see a whole bunch of different layer files that are represented on here, which you're seeing wetlands, at least the ones we're aware of, the hydric soils, which makes one element of could be a wetland, uh, flood hazard areas, um, streams, whether they're fish bearing or not. But again, please take note that just because you see some green area or some type of critical area feature, it does not exclude on the ground Ralph ground truthing, as well as just because it's not on these particular GIS layer files, because there are limitation on available data resource. On site, in the field, ground truthing may be necessary to really determine if or if not there's critical areas on there, including looking at topography as one of those options available on the left-hand side here. Hey, Angie, could you in show... In addition, we had some other questions. Oh, we had one more before we go into some other questions. Is a geotech study needed for a parcel that has slopes? So part of our critical areas webinar we had in August um, also talked about when geotech reports or letters are required as part of our critical areas ordinance or a fancy way of saying it, Kitsap County Code Title 19. So that area des describes the parameters as well as the contents of what that geotech report must include to show what may or may not be required, whether that's site design, but also building design to ensure if you live on a seismic hazard area, making sure that property is not only safe for future inhabitants, but those that, that are surrounding that area. Let's see here. I just wanted to mention to one of the questions. skim through questions right here. There's a really great question. Are there plans for bike lanes in the future road plans? Fantastic question. Um, actually, one of the elements in the goals and policies of the Kitsap County Comprehensive Plan is non-motorized transportation. And here in Kitsap, we often take our the kind of the blueprint framework, the comp plan, and then spill out into more detailed plans about certain topics. And that includes non-motorized facilities. So in 2018, circa 2016, 2018, Kitsap County adopted the Kitsap County non-motorized plan that sets forth a lot of regional networks, current designated bike paths, but also through the non-motorized volunteer committee that Public Works uh, helps facilitate, also identifies priorities for non-motorized improvements in the future. So with that, I'm jabbering on. So I'm going to throw a question out to Liz as she's just laughing at me. Okay. Um, we got a question here related to... Um, what is the official definition of affordable housing? Another great question that has a multifaceted answer to it. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention to Angie, would you mind showing um, on parcel search there um, the legend tab so folks can see? Um, can you hear me, Angie? I don't think Angie can hear me. Alicia, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, I just wanted to mention for parcel search, there is a legend. Um, if you click on the top, um, you can see what the colors on the map actually correlate to. Um, that was one of the questions we had earlier in the chat. Um, so I just wanted to mention that there is that um, um, that 
uh, ability to see what the different colors on parcel search mean. Um, so I think the question was with the shortage of affordable housing in general, why are ADUs required to go through a conditional permit, uh, conditional use permit process in the rural areas? Um, so this is uh, a lot of this has to do with case law history and also the fact that the Growth Management Act really encourages uh, development within the rural areas um, to ensure sure that um, there's protection of our natural resource, uh, our natural resource lands um, in the county. So um, one of the ways to help um, ensure that those impacts aren't occurring uh, to the natural environment is that conditional use permit review process, uh, which then allows the ability to take a look at the impacts associated with that development and address them um, that way. And um, yeah, so that is response to that question. Um, I know Angie just popped in my office because she couldn't hear me, um, but we could hear her um, talking about the different questions. Um, so the next one is a number of counties choose to opt out. Um, do they surrender resources by doing so? Um, I believe they would not be eligible for funding provided by the state and sometimes federal sources um, associated with the Growth Management Act um, as a result of um, not choosing to plan under it. So um, let's see, what other questions do we have here? Um, where should one start to look for info on an individual lot? Um, great question. Definitely recommend taking a look at parcel search. Um, it allows you to search by your address um, or uh, your, your name as an owner. Um, and that'll zoom you right into your lot and you can take a look at you know, what the zoning is, um, what your um, critical areas that are known on the site may, may be there um, as well. Um, so that's probably the best way to start out um, taking a look at personal search. Um, let's see, the next question here, are there plans for bike lanes in the future roads plan? So uh, the county does have a non-motorized plan, uh, which does take a look at bike lanes um, and other non-motorized facilities across the county um, and, and does plan for those, uh, again, over the comprehensive plan planning horizon of 20 years. Um, let's see here. What is the official definition of affordable housing? Um, that really, I think, depends on a lot of different things. The county, um, in the example we provided, is using... Um, the HUD standard, which is the federal standard for affordable housing, which essentially means that a family based on their household size is not spending more than 80% of their income on housing related expenses. So if you own a house, that would include your mortgage and utility payments. Um, if you're renting, again, that would be your rent on top of um, any utility bills that would be associated with that unit. Um, let's see. Next question. How does the GMA impact how many units of housing are built? Um, I think this really is impacted by um, the fact that the Growth Management Act envisions the majority of growth being located within urban areas. So if you're not located within an urban growth area, typically um, the number of housing units the, that you could have ranges from one unit per five acres to one unit per 20 acres. Um, so that is, um, you know, where it lands in the rural areas. And then in our urban areas, it really depends on the zone that you're in. Um, so it could be anywhere from one to four units per acre, um, all the way up to 30 plus dwelling units per acre. Um, so it really depends on what zone your property is located in um, and whether or not you're in an urban or rural area. All right, um, just plugging away here at these questions. Um, 
Is there a way to check on the status of a city county adherence to the GMA? Are they keeping up with their mandated population growth per the GMA? Yes. Um, so one of the requirements is um, that counties and the cities within do a regular review of whether or not their growth is aligning with their plans that they have in place. And we actually are just wrapping up that process here for Kitsap County. It's revert referred to as our buildable lands program. Um, and it takes a look at our targets um, during the 20 year planning horizon and sees, you know, is our population keeping pace with that target? Um, is our development occurring at the densities that we've planned for? Um, and that's, that's one way that we check in on that status. And if we are seeing inconsistencies, then the county takes a look at um, any changes that might be necessary as part of future uh, comprehensive plan update processes. So. All right, so the next question here um, from Kelsey. Um, with the shortage, oh, I think I hit on this one already, the ADUs in the rural areas. Um, so I'll skip that one. Um, I have heard that there is a Lammerd versus comp plan in the Manchester area and that it would likely not be included in the 2024 update. Do you have any additional information on this? So um, Lammerd stands for limited area of more intensive rural development. And these are typically historic uh, communities that have developed prior to the GMA that aren't really rural or urban in nature, um, but you are seeing a little more development in these areas. Manchester is one of those communities here in Kitsap County. Um, and as part of the 2024 update process, we will be looking at the sub area plan um, associated with the Manchester uh, community, um, but that would likely be just a light refresh uh, associated with the goals and objectives for that particular area. Um, so, yes, we will be taking a look at that in addition to all of our other uh, community sub area plans before June 30th of 2024. All right. Um, so let's see. Todd, is the county looking at ADU guidelines and possibly easing some of the requirements to help both affordable housing and multi-generational living situation? Um, yes, we are actually. So um, as part of a current code development project, um, our zoning use table update for urban areas, uh, we are looking at um, some flexibility associated with the guidelines for developing ADUs. So things like allowing more than one accessory dwelling unit on a property in the rural area, um, looking at uh, flexibility related to parking requirements, design requirements, size of those ADUs as well. Um, that project is scheduled to wrap up by uh, March of next year um, and likely will be effective in Kitsap County Code should the board approve those changes um, by about the mid part of um, this upcoming year, 2022. So... So why did we not opt out of GMA? Um, so this is really uh, related to the requirements of GMA have to do with population sizes in different um, counties and jurisdictions. So because of our population size here in Kitsap, uh, we are required to plan, fully plan um, for our, our county. All right. Um, so Joel, will ADUs be a larger part of solving population density issues? And will they be made easier as they are in other areas? So as I mentioned, we are going through an update process for looking at our regulations for urban um, accessory dwelling units and are hoping to wrap that update up by the mid part of next year. All right. Steve, let's see. I own a landlocked acreage parcel in North Kitsap County. The property had formerly belonged to Pope, um, but in prior years was acquired by Kitsap County for delinquent property taxes. Um, when the county sold the property to Pope, the county retained 50 foot wide strip along its south property line. Can these tax title strips be easily purchased? 
Um, and the tax statement says that this strip is owned now by Kitsap County Public Works Road Division. Um, definitely encourage you to reach out to Kitsap County uh, Public Roads Division. Um, they do take a look at some of their tax title strip holdings and will, um, in certain circumstances, um, work with adjacent property owners on purchasing those properties. But just want to validate with them that it is, you know, a tax title strip um, as opposed to like a right away easement or something of that nature. Um, but definitely reach out to our uh, public works team and they can point you in the right direction. Um, what is the status of the Sound to Olympics Trail and how is that affecting development? I don't know the status of the Sound to Olympic Trail. So maybe we can have uh, Angie hop back on um, or we can follow up with that one in just a little bit. Um, I do know we have a plan established with um, the Sound to Olympics, but um, in terms of how far that is in implementation, I can't speak to at this point. Um, so Ron, um, Kazmar or Karsmar. Um, I live in Kingston, which is an urban growth area and also within the district of the Port of Kingston. Um, in the past decades, Kingston has struggled with regards to shopping, retail, traffic control, economic vitality. Is the county or the port um, that should take the lead and guide us through to a brighter future? Um, I think, you know, the, the sub area plan for the community of Kingston lays out a vision and some goals and objectives related to future development in that area. Um, in addition, we've worked as a team um, here in the county over the last few years to refine some of the development regulations within the Kingston community to further support the goals and objectives, such as affordable housing, providing housing for all income types, in addition to supporting a walkable downtown um, area. And we are uh, currently working with the Port of Kingston. They've applied for a rezone um, of their existing port terminal. Um, so that project um, is currently working through the review process um, here at the Department of Community Development. Are developers required to build support infrastructure, water, sewers, and roads? So yes, as part of all private development, we take a look at any impacts associated with um, infrastructure, water, sewer, um, and those impacts are required to be mitigated as part of that development project. Um, and um, so that is reviewed on a project by project basis. Uh, but we also do have the county's capital facilities plan, uh, which identifies um, desired levels of service um, for our roads and different infrastructure um, that we make sure that our private development is ensuring that we are keeping pace uh, with those standards. All right. If developers make commitments in, for example, an SSDP application, how does Kitsap County track these commitments? Mm -hmm. um, and how do future earners know these commitments are attached to a property? Um, so this would be related to um, any type of mitigation or monitoring requirements associated with a, 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 a private development. Um, and so as part of uh, a current project that the department is working on, we're establishing a monitoring um, program for our critical areas ordinance, shoreline master program uh, ordinances and regulations. And so that is currently in the works uh, with the department. And um, one of the things that we're exploring is whether or not those um, requirements would need a notice to title so that future property owners that might purchase um, a property would know about those requirements and commitments. What is the projected growth for Kitsap County by 2030? Um, so we currently have population growth targets out to 2036. Um, and those are established for each of our urban growth areas across the county. And they're outlined in um, the countywide planning policies, which I can put a link in the chat to. Um, those are coordinated through um, the Kitsap um, County Regional Coordinating Council, which is made up of the local cities um, and Kitsap County. 
Um, and those are also currently being updated to help inform the upcoming comprehensive plan update process due by June 30th of 2024. Uh, so, and those targets will be set um, out to 2044. Um, and then let's see, if I have property in an urban area, can I build one home or do I need to build a minimum of four? Um, it would depend on the size and acreage of your parcel. Um, so depending upon um, how much area you have would determine, you know, how many homes would need to be built. Um, and this is really regulated by our zoning ordinance um, and the density dimensions and design table specifically um, in terms of uh, what um, how many units per acre must be uh, developed within our urban areas. All right. Um, is there an infrastructure plan for the upcoming hordes of people that will be coming from the Arborwood development? Um, so I believe the Arborwood development is subject to a development agreement that was put into place years ago. And so as this project moves forward, um, yes, they will be considering and doing upgrades to the infrastructure in the area to accommodate the new growth that um, will come along with that. Um, Arborwood should be forced to build 10% of affordable housing for Kingston. Um, I don't believe this was a requirement um, that was previously negotiated um, as part of the development agreement with that particular project. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, the county doesn't have standards that every project would have to meet those requirements. Um, but we recently have one example where the board has put that condition of approval on it. Um, so that could be something moving forward they could consider for future development projects as well. All right. Um, let's see. Um, Noah, is there any proposed expansion to a farm worker housing accommodations? Um, so as part of, um, I believe our agricultural code, there are some references to housing, um, but this is really driven by um, specifically our allowed density ranges, depending on where that farm is located um, and, and whether or not they could accommodate additional uh, units to have um, farm workers live within those. So no specific requirements um, at this time that I'm aware of. Um, it would be based on the zoning of the property. All right. Um, Doug, in that it is costly to provide road access for bikes, is there any plan to license them to keep or to help defray the cost? So like a bike license program. Um, I do not believe we currently have requirements for uh, bicycle licenses here in the county, um, but that's definitely a great question um, that we could uh, direct to our public works uh, department and see if there's any opportunities to help, um, again, provide additional um, opportunities for multimodal transportation. Um, and then BD, um, what's the housing development plan on Little Boston Road and Cliffside, the clear cut there? That might be in trouble land or it might be private, but we have to talk. Yeah, we'd have to touch base on it. Um, we're not sure if that location is located on tribal land um, or if that is part of the county, um, but we would definitely, you know, be interested in, in learning some more details on that project so we could better answer that question. Um, and then again from BD here, um, are there any limitations to building a residence on industrial zone properties? Yeah, typically um, the purpose and intent for industrial land is for industrial type uses such as manufacturing, fabrication, um, and you know, typically in terms of um, how zoning works, you're trying to ensure that compatible uses are going um, near each other. Um, and so, you know, typically having housing within an industrial zone parcel um, is not something that is currently allowed by our zoning ordinance. 
Um, and then Frank, can you talk a little bit about how the county has attempted to balance the need for increased density with the need to manage stormwater on site? This is a great question for Angie. <laughs> so hello, I'm Angie of the technological past. My computer is having issues and I couldn't hear anybody talk, which probably looked really awkward as you all listen to me jabber on. So in addition to the Washington State Growth Management Act that sets these kind of rural urban growth uh, objectives in Washington State, in implementation of the Federal Clean Water Act also requires the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System or NPDES for a short version of it. And that sets forth stormwater design as well as requirements for projects not only located in urban areas, but urban census defined areas. So areas outside of those UGAs we were showing via parcel search, but Kitsap County takes stormwater rules even further than the state requirements. And also through our water as a resource policy established by the Kitsap County Board of County Commissioners also establishes uh, stormwater design requirements for rural lands as well. So those regulations, whether you're an urban, rural, et cetera, there are stormwater requirements, whether it's a single family residence or all the way to a subdivision or commercial property. And the tiering and the requirements vary depending on the proposed activity and use of the property itself. So there also are other guiding state mandates, including the MPDS program, here in Washington state that we have to incorporate and a project has to show not only compliance with density, for example, of their zone, but they also have to show compliance for stormwater requirements, whether that is at a preliminary land use level where we're seeking 60% design feasibility or 100% design to start construction via, for example, a site development activity permit or an SDAP. Right. Um, so BD, you clarified the earlier question. Yes, it's tribal land. Um, so those projects are typically then reviewed by tribal staff. Um, they're outside of the county's jurisdiction and kind of land use review um, uh, purview. Um, so is there a South Kitsap sub-area plan or is it all included in the city of Port Orchard? Um, so there used to be a South Kitsap sub-area plan way back in the day, um, but it has not been updated um, recently. Oh, geez, everyone's laughing right now. I'm wondering why. Um, <laughs> um, and so... Um, uh, so from there, um, there is not a specific sub-area plan uh, for the South Kitsap um, area specifically. Ron, um, if we hire our own planning staff in Kingston, would you be interested? My boss is sitting right here, but make me an offer I cannot refuse. No, Ron, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. She uh, is great. I agree. <laughs> Um, so Lisa Hurt, um, is there a set number of green space that is being set aside and protected for all new developments? Um, so we do have, as part of certain projects, um, recreational requirements in addition to critical area protections. Um, and depending upon how a project moves forward in the permit review process, we also have um, open space requirements related to um, our um, performance-based developments. So it really depends on the features of the site, um, but yes, there are uh, open space requirements for like multifamily um, development in addition to some of our subdivisions as well. All right, so Steve, City of Polsbo shares um, joint jurisdiction with Kitsap County for properties inside of the Polsbo yep, urban growth area. And Polsbo does not allow sewer or water unless the property is annexed. That is correct. Um, will not consider annexation to individual owners, but wants large number of properties to come into the city at once. Um, these properties are held hostage because of many neighboring ownerships, have existing residences, and are not ready to sell yet. Um, does Kitsap County encourage annexation and work with the city to reconsider some of their worlds? Absolutely. We're working with the city of Polsbo on a regular basis, coordinating um, on these 
these things. Um, and, um, you know, definitely recognize that there are certain challenges associated with annexation and property owners willingness uh, to do that. Um, but we do have um, combined zoning. So we do review against um, the city of Paul's both standards uh, within our urban growth area, again, to ensure that coordinated growth over time. And I think it's important, Steve, too, when it comes to annexation, that GMA encourages annexation of urban areas and that urban areas are intended to become cities, whether they're the standalone city or annexed to an existing city. So that's part of annexation law, which is another guiding statute. And in addition to what growth management also at, requires is urban services. So if you're in that urban area and it happens to be the city is the majority of the urban service provider, they do have the ability to set forth policies, their own, their own elected bodies on what the requirements are to connect to those services. But to be in an urban area, you do have to provide urban services to your urban development. So that's kind of the, the, the balancing act of these multiple state mandates and how to implement that at the local level. Mm -hmm. All right. Um... This might be in response to BD's earlier question. So for Gamble's Gollum tribe, purchased the land at Little Boston and Cliffside from Pope, um, but it's north of the reservation boundary. Do they or do they not have to follow county guidelines or because they own it, does it allow them to circumvent the county? I think it re relates to whether or not it is actually owned by the tribe and designated that way, um, and if so, then they would they would follow tribal uh, tribal jurisdiction um, even outside of the reservation boundary. Is my understanding? Did we hit on all of them, Alicia, or am I missing some? I think you hit on all of them, and we only have a couple minutes. So um, you guys have been a great active participants and questions. And I'm sure Liz is probably um, needs a big glass of water right about now. <laughs> uh, agreed. I apologize, everybody. <laughs> Technology and my speakers and microphone were not on my side today. We As really you can't see me on the screen, so which is even more weird. So. <laughs> I hope everybody has a good afternoon. The floating voice. <laughs> floating voice. <laughs> we appreciate all of you guys attending. We will have another Start Here webinar coming up um, probably in early December. So please take a look at our website um, for information. And if you are not on our face, Kitsap County Facebook page, we put out announcements there as well. We also... Um, there's a way to sign up for messaging and um, on our um, website. We'll include that in our links that we'll send as a follow-up to the Zoom. So thanks so much, everyone, and um, have a good rest of your day. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>